So we finished the last screencast just by looking at the summary of a, a simple regression model using the LM function in R, uh, looking at what all these different things means, like the estimate, standard errors, the t values, et, uh, et cetera. Very simple model and, and trying to interpret some of the things. The other thing that I want you to get used to looking at that I think is incredibly important, we'll use a lot, is the variance covariance matrix for the estimated parameters. Now, I want to remind people that we're not talking about the variances and covariances of our observed data. So we're not talking about taking, say, the tarsus uh, variable and just looking at the variance or the covariance between sex comb teeth and, and the tarsus per se, but instead about for our estimates, we've now estimated these parameters. How do our actual parameters estimate, um, covary with each other? And this becomes very important for a, a lot of a lot of things in, in, in both diagnosing linear models and making sense. And we'll use this all, the same basic idea or something very similar with maximum likelihood estimation, something called the Hessian matrix that we'll come back to. And the way to do this is to use the V co function. And the V co function is specifically for um, looking at the variance covariance of estimated parameters. So we can just do that for here. Of course, we've only estimated two parameters, which are the intercept and the slope associated with Tarsus predictor here. Um, and what can we make of this? Well, before we, we think about the covariances between the intercept and the slope, um, we, can, we can ask the question, how can we get standard errors for the estimates from, from this matrix? So I would like you to pause for a second and think about looking at these numbers if there's any way to get the standard errors from, from these numbers. Again, think about this is on the diagonal, these are the variances associated with the parameters. And think about what the standard error is. You should be able to figure that out. Okay, so we'll answer that question for the standard errors in a little bit. The useful thing, the, the other useful thing here is interpreting the covariance between these two. Um, so what you will notice here is that the relative magnitude of this, this covariance between the slope and the intercept, which are the off-diagonal elements here and, and symmetric, this matrix will always be symmetric, so above and below the diagonal will, will be equivalent numbers, um, negative 0.74. Is that a big number? Is that a small number? What does that tell us? That's giving us an idea about how much as, you know, either due to subtle changes in the data or subtle changes in, in how we fit the model, how we, when we change one estimate, the, the estimate of, say, the slope, how that will influence the intercept or vice versa. And that makes the point of these parameters are not being independently estimated. We're jointly estimating them, and we only have a fixed set of data, and when we're jointly estimating all these things, if, if there's some relationship between these variables or, bit, or in something that we, way we've modeled it, that may influence our estimates. Ultimately, we'd like to, as much as possible, estimate these parameters independently of one another. How close are we to, are these to each other? One thing we can use is called the cove to core function. And basically this is gonna take this covariance matrix and con convert it to a correlation matrix. And, and uh, correlation of a variable on itself, of course, is one, so we don't have to worry about the diagonals. We do wanna look at the off diagonals. So the correlation between the intercept and the slope, the estimated intercept and the slope, is negative 0.99. That means they're almost perfectly negatively correlated. That's bad. That means we're really not independently estimating these two things. Something, something is wrong. What's going wrong? Well, it's worth definitely thinking about, and hopefully some of you have already, who've, who've taken uh, any other stats courses probably already know the answer to it. But in this particular case, it's essentially because we're uh, if we think about what we did with our intercept up here, this intercept was saying, hey, this is our estimate for the number of sex comb teeth we expect to observe when the tarsus is zero. Well, the tarsus is never zero. In fact, our tarsus, the length of tarsus is never even close to zero. And so we're extrapolating that line, that best fit line, way outside the range of our data. And so we're going to spend some time thinking about that and, and interpreting our coefficients, thinking about the need to center covariates and the like. Okay, and as we, we already went over this, it's very difficult to interpret that intercept because um, tarsus length is, is never zero. That's clearly very si silly. And let's actually plot the data and sort of think about this. One of the things we can do, I should make a point, is that the AB line uh, function is a very useful function. Again, it's a, a, a generic 
function that call can call specific class specific methods. When you use it for a uh, linear model, uh, especially for a simple one, it will actually plot from that linear model specifically. So what we're going to do here is plot uh, sex complete as a function of tarsus. And then we're going to, sorry, you can't see it quite yet, and we're going to fit a line on top of it. Oops, that's right. Let's actually catch the whole thing. And this is what it looks like. So here's our observed data, sex comb teeth, tarsus. Here's the cluster of data, and this is the intercept right here at six or so. So we're fitting way outside the range of our data. And if you remember with a regression, somewhere right around here, so if you can see my mouse cursor, that's the mean of both tarsus and sex comb teeth. That's the pivot point for this line. It has to, the, the regression line has to go through the mean of both the, the response and the predictor variable. So we're pivoting around that line, the slope pivot, pivots around that line. But if we have to fit this intercept way out here, it's going to have a huge influence in this, in this line because we have to fit through this mean and we also have to fit way out here, well outside the range of the data. And that's a real problem. Okay. And one of the things we can actually do is look at the confidence bands uh, to get a sense of our, our sense of uncertainty with it. And it's a little bit uh, complicated the way that, that this is done in R, unfortunately. What essentially we have to do, and the reason we're going to do this so we can actually take a look at, at the uncertainty and how bad it is, especially out by the intercept, um, we're going to actually gener generally generate a new set of values for our explanatory variable. So we're almost using this to generate our confidence bands where it's almost predicting new, uh, pre predicting new observations of sex comb teeth. So first we say, here are new potential values for our explanatory variables. And you can actually just uh, take any values you want. Usually you take them within the range of, of the observations of, of, of your observations. So here, you know, our, if we take a look back at this plot, Tarsus really is between, say, 0.1 and 0.25. So we might generate a sequence of numbers between 0.1 and 0.25. We can actually even just use the raw observed numbers. Either would work. Um, but in this case, we want to make a range all the way back to zero, since we want to fit back to the intercept. Clearly, that's a crazy number biologically, but let's do it. So what we're going to do is fit, make a data frame. And in that data frame, we just have one variable called tarsus. And it has to have the same name as our our covariate that that's in the model. So tarsus was the name of the covariate, so it has to be tarsus. If it's something else, it has to be that same name. And we're saying tarsus is a sequence from zero to basically the maximum value of, of tarsus by whatever, 0.005. Again, you could you, we could use observed. It wouldn't work be as useful for this because we want to make a point of what it looks like out at zero. So we do that. And if you need to, pause, take a look at, at this data frame to make sure you understand what's, what's in it. Um, and then what we're going to do is use the predict function. The predict function, again, is a, one of these uh, generic functions that calls class-specific methods. And it's going to predict values uh, uh, for sex comb teeth, for our, our response variable, for our new explanatory, for the, the new values of tarsus, for our new predictive variables. So we go pr predict regression one. So it's going to use the model one parameters, uh, regression dot one parameters, the model we fit, using new tarsus, which is the name of our uh, th the data frame that has our uh, our predictor variables, and then we can specify different kinds of intervals. We can just do confidence intervals or prediction intervals. For right now we're just going to do confidence, uh, and we do that. Call that. And that's going to generate, we can just look at the head of that, predicted, oops, predicted, is that dot? Can't remember. Predicted dot. There we go. And what we can see is we would get for each observation the fitted value. Essentially, this is going to be right on that same best fit line. We'll come back to that. And the lower and upper confidence interval for each of those values. One thing to know about the um, setting this up with this prediction the uh, explanatory var variables that we use, whether it's the observed or, or just a made-up sequence like we did here, that, that hopefully is biologically re reasonable that, that we've used, has to be sorted. It has to be in order. Otherwise, you get very wonky results. So we do that. We've, we've got this, these predicted values. And now, essentially, we're just going to fit three lines back onto it. The first line, uh, x new tarsus 1. So there's only one in, in 
uh, new Tarsus, there's only uh, one uh, variable, which is called Tarsus. That's the first column. Uh, and that's just our Tarsus lengths, or our predicted, or our, sorry, our theoretical Tarsus lengths going from 0 to, to whatever the maximum value was, probably about 0.25. Uh, and our y values are essentially our predicted values for sex comb teeth. The first one, the first column, we know from down here is fit. And that's so this first one will just produce a line that will, in fact, overlap with our original line. So I'll bring it back. All you can see, all I've done is made it a thicker line. So it's that thick black line. We do that again now uh, for the upper and then again for the lower uh, confidence intervals. The only thing here is I've colored those gray and made the lines a little thinner and stippled so we can see it. Um, for here, it doesn't really matter. And what you can see is we now have these stippled lines out here. And you can see it's very, very narrow around here. It doesn't seem to capture a lot of the variation in the data, but we have so much of it that, that we have very narrow confidence intervals. Bends in, then sort of bends on out, and it bends way out here. We could, we could definitely plot or zoom into this, but that the, the uh, confidence interval is really, really big out here at the intercept. And that shouldn't be a surprise, because this is way outside the range of our data. And given the, the issues that we had of sort of pivoting here at the mean, it's always going to be narrow near the mean and get further and further out. So that's going to make this wider in addition to trying to really extrapolate uh, our fit well outside the range of our data, which is the major problem here. How are we doing for time? Good. Got a couple more minutes. Um, so we can also uh, think about looking at this in a different way. So what we, we just did, the plot we just took a look at, here, this top plot, is a plot in observational space. So we're looking at the observed sex compete and the observed tarsus, and we're fitting our model into that observed data space. But we can also look in parameter space. So we can essentially say, well, what does uh, the variation look like or the variances look like in, in our plot parameter space? So essentially, this is coming out of that v cov function, the variance covariance, the parameter estimates. And we're using a function from the car package called confidence ellipse. And if you do this for this model, what it produces <clears throat> is right here is the joint estimate down here of the intercept, so our estimate of six, 6 and change, and for the slope, which was whatever, 26, almost 27 value. And this ellipse says, here's our confidence slope for parameter values. And one thing you'll notice here is that this ellipse uh, has a lot, I mean, you can see very clearly the, the covariation that... Um, that the, the uh, estimated values of the intercept and slope are highly dependent on each other. It's not like we can change the estimate of the slope somehow down here and this have no effect on the intercept. In fact, would drag, you know, if we decrease the value of the slope somehow, we're changing the data or changing something subtle in the model, it would increase dramatically the estimated value for the intercept. So this is just a visualization, essentially, of that strong negative correlation that negative correlation that was almost equal to 1. Again, just making the point uh, of, of how problematic it is of extrapolating this far out. Okay, so well, what do we do? And we can ignore the commented section. We'll come back to that when we come to Mar Monte Carlo simulations. Um, so what do we do? Well, the easiest thing to do is to center the covariates. In fact, this is often a very sensible thing to do when you're Covariates take on values, you know, if you think about it, the intercept is well outside the range of your data. It doesn't make sense to have an intercept of zero for your data. Then you can center it. And that what that means is zero will then be uh, the mean value. And so the, what we're going to do here, well, I guess we're remaking the plot too, um, is we're just going to create a new variable called cent.tarsus, just for centered tarsus, and we're just centering it. So we're just taking tarsus minus mean of tarsus. Um, that's one of the great uses of R because it's vectorized, so it's going to take each observation of this minus uh, the, the mean of this, which will always be the same number. So essentially it's going to subtract the mean from each observation. We'll just call that. Uh, you can also use the scale function to do this with center equals true and scale equals fa false. Scale equals true will actually standardize, in other words, divide by the standard deviation. We don't want to do that here. And we can just take a quick look at this. So here's the histogram on top of the observed values for Tarsus, and below is just the same values, just centered. And you should see that the distributions look 
pretty damn similar. They should be essentially identical. We may have changed the brakes subtly. I didn't control for that. Um, the only thing that's really changed is the mean. Everything's just been uh, translated over to the origin. Okay, we can also look uh, at the means. So our original mean was, I don't know, 11, in, or, or uh, for Tarsus was 0.81. Now our new mean after centering is essentially zero. Uh, computationally, that's pretty damn close to zero. 2.0 times 10 to the negative 18, it's close to zero. Um, we can also take a look. Things like the standard deviation should not change. We haven't changed the the variation in the data, we've just translated it all, and indeed they're identical to one another. Okay, so what do we do with this? Well, we're going to rerun this model with the centered covariate. So regression.2 here is exactly the same model as above, we're just using the centered uh, tarsus variable instead of just tarsus by itself. So we run that. Does that make a difference? Let's actually do the plot like we did before. We take a look at it. We can see that here's the mean at zero. We're fitting uh, our intercept is here, right here at zero. We're fitting this line through it, and we're really fitting it through the cloud of the data. We're not extrapolating outside of the range of the data. We'll do, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll uh, fit the confidence intervals just like we did before. I won't uh, run through the code, and we'll also look at the confidence intervals just like we did be below. And what you can see now, let's really zoom into this, this guy, uh, you can see that the confidence lip, yes, it gets broader on both ends because, like I said, right at, at the, the center point here, at the means, at the estimates of um, this uh, slope and interest, or sorry, at the means for both variables, it's going to be narrowest in this right at the head of the cloud. Out here where we have less data, and we're further from, from the estimate, they get a little bit broader. That's fine, though. They're not too broad. Um, we also see, and again, on the top here, this is an observational space. We're looking at observed sex comb teeth and observed centered tarsus length, but essentially it's still observed variables. Um, and here, down here, we're looking at parameter space uh, for the, the estimate for the slope and the estimate for the intercept. And you see that they no longer so strongly uh, depend on each other, that they don't co-vary particularly strongly. Uh, and we can do this, um, of course, let's clear up the screen, we can just go vcove and regression.2, and we can see uh, for our intercept and uh, the slope, again on the diagonals, it looks like uh, it's, it's uh, what it, we'd have to calculate, I'm not, not good with 10 to the negative 3, so what is that, point oh one two six for intercept and three point nine for the slope that should have not changed we'll come back to this in a second but what's important here is that these numbers are effectively zero now for the covariance and again we can look at the cove two core for these the cove. and indeed again the diagonals will be one here but what's important is that the Covariation between the estimated intercept and estimated slope are effectively now zero, and that's what we want. Okay, and I think we will come back, to, we'll pause there, this is already 18 minutes, so we'll pause there, and that gives you one example of something we can do to deal with this example. And this is, in fact, an example of a type of collinearity um, that can happen. It's not a collinearity between variables per se, although we'll, we'll come back to it it's, uh, to this issue later.